I also wanted to just um, let you know a little bit about the, the symposium. So this is the last uh, online event of the Fluid Mutualism Symposium. Um, we've been working on this for a, a, few, a few months. Um, it was, it's been very exciting. Um, the symposium is coming out of um, what we call in Mexico, the communal flower. And the communal flower stems out of corn cultures, um, out of the being people of the corn. Uh, corn is our mothers, uh, and that is who we owe our life to. Um, and so the communal flower offers us um, a, a, a framework, essentially a guideline instructions of how to have a healthy community. Um, and some of these um, pillars are uh, the ones that we have been exploring through fluid mutualism. And so two of the pillars are the focus of the symposium. Uh, one being communal responsibility. How are we responsible to each other? How do we show up for each other? And the other being um, uh, assembly. So how do we gather, right? And I think this is really important at this time that we're still in the pandemic, but we're shifting out of being in isolation, out of being in our homes into being back together. Uh, the Fluid Mutualism Symposium is also um, honoring and thinking about water and what water teaches us, right? So from uh, indigenous perspective. Um, and I think that so much of what um, water is, I mean, what is alive, what is a living being, we are water transforming, but water very much is also memory, what water remembers, right? And um, this little bit of water that I have here has been a cloud. So what you're seeing here, you know, in the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, RIP, this is a cloud. This was a cloud and it transformed and now it's in this cup, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this symposium is also in a way a cloud because I couldn't have done this symposium if it wasn't for this cloud, if it wasn't for this water. Um, and so it, it asks us to think about, uh, what we are leaving behind, right? What, what is our relationship to ourselves as water, but to the other water around us? And, um, and what do we wanna leave behind, right? What we do with the water inside us and the water around us will impact life uh, for the generations to come, not only for our species, but for other species. So at this point, I, I just want to do a, a land acknowledgement. Um, and the first thing I want to say is I want to I want to take a moment to thank to thank this water and to take to thank these ancestors um, and uh, to thank it for everything that it gives us. It gives us life. It, without water, there would be no life. In, in Mexico, we say with you everything, without you nothing. Contigo mm -hmm. todo sin ti nada. Um, I also want to take a moment to show gratitude to the earth, uh, which allows us all to be here breathing together in this uh, virtual space. Um, um, I also want to thank the indigenous people, the original people of this land, the Ohlone people, including the Chechenian Karkin in, in Kuchin, also called Oakland, the Raymatush in Yelamu, San Francisco, the Yokuts in the South Bay, and the Muwekma who have been in this unceded territory moving throughout uh, Huchin, Yelamu um, for generations since time immemorial, caring for the bay, for the forest, for the winds, for the animals. Without what they did and what they continue to do, we would not be able to enjoy the life that we have here. So let's pay our, our respects to the indigenous people that are here. Um, I want to also invite all of us to really <clears throat> make sure that in any space that we go to, any place that we go to, that we acknowledge and that we work with indigenous people and with their leadership. Uh, I also want us to recognize and support that indigenous people 
um, in your territory. So in the chat, let us know where you are situated, what indigenous territory you are in, um, what indigenous people took care of that land, of that ecosystem. Um, and I also wanna make a note that according to many sources, testimonies, many stories, indigenous people take care and sustain 80% of biodiversity in this planet. And even though they do this through their way of living, through our way of living, uh, indigenous people are threatened by governments, by nation states, by corporations for this way of living, for this labor, for, for defending life, water and earth itself. So please make sure that you know what territory you're in, what indigenous nation that you're living in and try to support it through any organization that you're in. I wanna uh, you know, encourage CCA and any organization that I'm part of to pay Shumi tax to support and share the abundance to the indigenous people of this land. Um, at this point, I just wanna uh, first and foremost, thank Valencia and Quill for being here and for being part of this important conversation as artists, as uh, visual makers, as uh, storytellers. Uh, you are really important to the community. The work that you do is really important, is really valuable, and it holds so much memory and it holds also so much, so much information, so much so much spirit, so much energy, so much vitality. Uh, and I wanna thank you for the work that you do and I wanna thank you for your time here. So I'm gonna pass the mic now to my dear friend, Valencia Jimpatelli, who is going to start us off with the first uh, mini lecture here. So thank you so much, Tlaxocamatimia. Hi, thank you for coming. Thank you, Brenny and everyone else. Um, my name is Valencia Jimpatelli and I'm currently in Brooklyn, New York. Um, Lenape land, um, Bedside, Brooklyn. And um, I'm going to share with you some of my work. I'm going to share my screen and we can sort of get started here. All right. Okay, here we go. Um, <clears throat> so this is just my landing page of announcing what um, the symposium is about today. And uh, we'll move through. Yeah. Um, this is me in my studio and uh, my bio. I'll leave it here for a few moments for you guys to read. Or I can read it for you. <laughs> um, Valencia Jean Patelli is a self-taught black non-binary non artist working and living in Brooklyn, New York on the Napi land. I experiment with three-dimensional textures to create media, works, and sculptures. Um, my nonlinear practice allows me to blend stories from ancestors with historical, theoretical, and Yoruba cultural references that stem from the African diaspora. My work explores the, margin the marginalization of queer and Black American culture through environmental and pop culture references. I create multi layers of textures by transforming various common materials into artifacts and heirlooms. I place a really important, a lot of importance on my choice of materials such as gold, plaster, wood, burlap, canvas, and other non traditional materials. My intention is to invoke radical and provocative stories that challenge this narrative intersection. And here we start with um, the sculptural works that I've been working on for the past couple of years. And in the Yoruba culture, what they call these are egg bays. And an egg bay is a spiritual companion, a guide, an artifact, a relic of, a, of something familiar and unknown. They share a connection between heaven and earth, the sky, the sea, they possess wisdom and govern, govern over dreams, wealth, prosperity, meditation, and healing. They are a language shared in prayer and dreams, a voice to and from the astral realm, and symbolize the trust between themselves, the guide, and offering faith. They're, in, they're androgynous and can take any form. Textured by barnacle formations, the Igbe surface and fractures signal their resonance with Olakun, excuse me, the owner of the ocean and the depths of the sea. Plaster, 
plaster casts mixed with a variation of punch hole, paper size and weight. They affect and create an outer texture which results in a fracture within the structure. These are some objects that I've made and um, that go back to my primary materials of plaster. Um, these to me mimic teeth um, and something that is more unearthed and archeological um, that represents in the shape of what I call in a very schematic way, a barracoon. This is another piece that um, I created that what, you, what you're seeing in the middle are these stacked paper punch holes. And this also um, is created in a shape of a barracoon or what we know is um, of the barracks of a slave ship. My materials are mainly sourced and from found um, discarded things. This a particular piece, it's called Gold Standard. And I created this piece for a show I did a few years ago, a group show um, about the Little Rock Nine. And um, this piece was created um, with recycled packing paper, um, cotton and gold the layers stacked upon each other create this really beautiful weight um, and with the binding it's sort of gathering information um, and keeping it sacred uh, these objects that i've created um, the one to your left is made out of plaster um, cotton and spray paint um, this i like to call a chain and it references um, gold and gold chains and pop culture, specifically um, the Black American culture. Um, gold is very important to me because of its intention. Um, you know, the idea that it's unearthed and how it symbolizes from, you know, colonialism and to how we, how it's represented in pop culture is something that I've always been extremely interested in. Now the piece to the right is made out of burlap and this is something that is sort of like a discovery piece. I call it cloth and it's bound together um, by hemp and I left the, the metal hook in it to sort of just give it this idea of weaving um, and modern day technologies as sewing. This is another work I created called Things Fall Apart. Um, this is plaster on a uh, wood, wood panel. And the idea of it was, so things will, will fall away um, over time. It's a bit ephemeral. And um, as you can see, the, the white pieces underneath, those are, those are things that just sort of happened over time. Um, these two works, um, for me were sort of these beginning pieces. The piece on the left, if you can sort of see, it's a bit of like a holograph, I call it skull. And it is a five by five foot um, piece that I've wrapped in twine um, and then primed and painted. Um, this work is also in conversation with a piece to the right, which is called Gold Glock. And I wanted to reference gun culture, but also really focus on the vibrance of gold and comparing it to the, the loss of life and how precious it is and um, the textures on it um, or sort of this like scraping thing that I was doing to, you know, for me, it's very beautiful, but also it's showing some struggle. And that's the end. These are the places where you can find my work, but Brandy will also share those at the end of this. Incredible. Um, can we give it up with the reactions? Let's, let's uh, activate the chat. Let's put some reactions here um, for mm -hmm. Valencia's presentation. 
And if you have any questions, hold your questions. We will have a Q&A in a moment. Um, but let's, uh, let's uh, show Valencia some love. Over Thank here you. With the sparks. And let's see. So I will start sharing my screen at this point. And we'll go back here. And let me see, let me see the sparks. I don't see the sparks over here. I'm gonna put some sparks. Yes, magical, magical work, beautiful work. Thank you, Valencia. And we're gonna pass Thank the you. mic now uh, to Quill. Uh, so if you have any questions, hold on to them. You can ask them uh, towards the end. We'll have a Q&A. So uh, hold your questions or you can begin to write the questions uh, and send them to me or um, send them to Rindy's as well. Um, and we're gonna pass the mic now to Quill. Um, so thank you so much. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Quill Christy Peters. I'm speaking today from Thunder Bay, which is in Northwestern Ontario in kind of like central Northern Canada. Um, it's the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation. Uh, it's also covered by the Robinson Superior Treaty. Um, so that's where I'm here today speaking to you from, right on the North Shore of Lake Superior. I can see it out of my window here. So it's good medicine, that water medicine. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've prepared like a little presentation for today and, and I have some slides as well. Um, I do like to write creatively. So sometimes I'm going to be like reading off of my paper just because um, I feel like that speaks to my work the best. Um, and yeah, let me just start my screen. Okay, does it look good? <laughs> it looks great. Okay. All right, so um, this is just a little bit about who I am and where I come from. Um, so I'm Anishinaabe from Treaty 3 territory, which is kind of like right beside where I am today. Um, spans across Northwestern Ontario. And more specifically, I come from a community called Lactamalac First Nation. And I'm also Scottish and Irish on my mother's side. And I come from the Peters and Cabote families on my father's side. Um, so this slide is just a bunch of pictures of family. Um, the top left is my mom and my dad, my brothers and my daughter. Um, the bottom is an older photo, but that's my um, dad at the far left. Looks like an alien. And the bigger picture on the right is a, one of my favorite pictures because it's four generations of us, which I think is really beautiful. And then the middle picture is my grandma on my mom's side looking like a model. So that's a little bit about um, who I am and, and where I come from. Um, the work that I do, I'm a painter, um, but I am also like a beadwork artist. I do traditional tattoo work as well. And then I'm also an educator. Um, I work as the director of education for the Indigenous Curatorial Collective. And within that role, um, I design and kind of facilitate um, like art programs for Native youth. So that's a little bit about the work that I do. Um, so today I'm just, I really wanted to just respond to the theme of this talk and kind of explore how I relate to these concepts of memory and bones and restitution. Um, and yeah, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about art making as a practice of falling in love, which is something I've kind of talked about and explored before. So, so yeah, I'm gonna start um, with the body. So a lot of my work, almost all of my work depicts the body in some way. Um, but as an Anishinaabeg person, I don't think of my body as just the physical body. I think about it as everything else. So. My body is the great beyond, uh, the whispers of my ancestors in my ear, the soft hum of lakes that have held my family. My body was home for my daughter, holder of time and space, deep red blood, and the soft waters that welcomed her. 
My body is many things all at once, flickering under moonlight. We are everything that could not be contained. Um, because my body is all of these things, um, my body is also infinite knowledge, uh, the knowledge of my ancestors, my homelands, all of the components of creation that I'm tethered to, the knowledge of that is within my own body. Um, so in other words, my bones hold, you know, many stories, my bones are memory, but also beyond. Um, my bones are the keepers of many living relationships that make me who I am. So for me, I'm thinking about this discussion, not just as memory um, in terms of like looking back and what's in the past, I'm thinking about it as really activating these living relationships that are currently uh, in my body and my bones that extend beyond linear time and the physical body. So next when I thought about like this idea of restitution in the bones, um, of course it made me think about settler colonialism and just grappling um, with all the things that attempt to disconnect us. Um, I've written a lot about this before, but just to like give a brief summary of the ways that colonialism has operated specifically where I'm from. Um, we, my like family has experienced um, the flooding of our reserve through hydroelectric dams, uh, residential school that my father went to, um, anti-Indigenous violence, which it's like where I am in Thunder Bay, it's like, it's just wild. It's like rampant. Uh, and so on and so forth. I don't really want to talk too much about that today, but just wanted to like reference those specific histories. Um, and for me, like there's so many different ways to define and explore settler colonialism. Um, but to bring it back to this discussion of like the bones and art and restitution, I think it was useful for me to think about um, settler colonialism as an attempt to remove me from my body. Um, so this could literally mean, you know, the process of removing bodies from the earth through like genocide that is ongoing. Um, it could also mean removing bodies from homelands through processes of displacement. And then lastly, it could also mean um, removing the self from the body. So um, kind of like, you know, settler colonialism creates these conditions where sometimes like we don't even want to be close with our bodies because of all the violence that we endure. Um, oh yeah, so this painting, just to give it context, is just a painting that I made to envision like if I could time travel and like hold my dad and like tell him something before he res went to residential school, like what that would look like. So that's just, that's my settler colonialism painting. Um, so yeah, I've written a lot about um, pleasure before and painted pleasure um, and painted bodies feeling pleasure and self-pleasure and all that. Um, so basically thinking about how a practice of feeling whole or good in our bodies um, directly pushes back against that um, process of colonialism trying to remove us from intimacy with ourselves. Um, so when we feel good, it's not just, you know, physical pleasure, it's also pleasurable for like our ancestors and for the universe and for all these different like components that we're tethered to. Um, so that's kind of what I tried to do with these paintings is reference like the violence that like my dad went through and all these different people and um, how like an act of pleasuring the body can mean so much more than just uh, straight up physical pleasure. Um, so yeah, so when I thought about restitution, uh, I was thinking about settler colonialism, um, what has been taken, what has been obscured, that kind of thing. But then, you know, when I thought about how I relate to my body, as this kind of like hub for all of these living relationships. I don't think that things can truly be taken from us. Like I think they can be obscured or hard to find, but I think that they're always there in the body. Um, and yet, yeah, 
they're often obscured or inaccessible by virtue of the violence that we're constantly facing. So for me, I'm approaching uh, restitution not necessarily as like recovering lost knowledge or culture or um, practices. It's more about reclaiming uh, our relationship to our bodies in this more expansive way. So like reclaiming our intimacy with all of these different ways that we uh, gather knowledge uh, in our own selves and bodies. Um, so another way that I think about colonialism is as like this attempted compartmentalization of life. Um, so I think of it as like a really complex system, um, but it needs to like break down pieces of people and distinguish them from one another to create um, hierarchies that then create like the systems of colonialism that form what we know today. Um, so in this way of thought, like bodies separate from land, art is separate from life. Um, and this is very much reflected in all aspects of, you know, like Western society, but also especially in the art world too. Um, it's very much focused on like the product versus the process, you know, the aesthetics of something versus like what's under the surface that you'll never be able to see. Um, skill versus like messy relationship building. Um, so for Anishinaabeg, like from a different perspective than like the Western perspective on art, our art is really everything all at once. Um, can't be defined really. Uh, spilling over all of the boundaries and more. Um, art is the practice of being unable to be contained within the rigid categorizations and boundaries of settler colonialism. And for me, art is really the practice of being with our bodies in the ways that I'm describing, um, the act of dancing with our ancestors in the great beyond. Um, so I think of the body as like the technology that allows us to exit linear time and explore and be in dialogue with our spiritual relations. And then I think of art as the pretty much the only way we can communicate this type of knowledge with one another, which is really beautiful. And also like just referencing, like in a traditional sense for Anishinaabeg people, like art was always an integral part of our governance systems because um, we wanted to build our communities, not just in dialogue with like people and animals and places, but also with like the spiritual realm and our ancestors. So art was how we, ensured that that was a part of how we organized and governed ourselves. Um, art was not considered separate from body or life or land. Um, so I've kind of like carried this understanding of like art and body from a young age. Like I've always felt really lucky to feel that in myself. It's given me great peace in my life. Um, I've always felt the soft vibration of my body alive with all my relations. I've always known and felt my ancestors at the edge of skin. I've always felt the waters of my homelands within me. And my personal art practice has very much just been a reflection of that and kind of just a translation of my internal worldview. Um, but on the other hand, my more like collaborative education-based practice has very much been about explicitly about um, restitution. Um, so more in line with reclaiming a space for Native youth to access, like a sovereign space for us to explore what art means to us. Um, so this is just a quick um, little blurb about the program that I created and run. Um, it's called the Indigenous Youth Residency Program. It hires six Native youth um, and we work through this kind of Anishinaabe artistic methodology. So we treat relationship building as the actual art practice itself. Um, it's not like skill-based or anything like that. And we explore relationships to self, homelands, ancestors and community together and also tie that with discussion about how colonialism impacts all of those relationships. Um, so the program is a sovereign space. It's one where we like explicitly presence the body um, as a site of ancestral knowledge. Um, 
and yeah, in other words, it's just a space for young people to really um, feel their living memory in their bones. Or it's for me really a space of restitution in that sense of reclaiming just that like space to do this kind of work. Um, so yeah, the this program was born out of my master's thesis um, years ago, and I titled my thesis uh, by art making us falling in love. And I always come back to this because I truly think of it as a process of falling in love. Um, so in the program, you know, we gather together and fall in love with ourselves. Uh, we gather together and fall in love with each other. We gather together and truly see one another. Um, we gather together and feel the embrace of our ancestors, feel their warmth as we remember how close they truly are. We name our disconnections together and smile because we know that nothing can ever truly be taken from us. The universe swirls around in our beautiful bodies, um, full of love. So that's all I wanted to share today, just kind of like how I thought about these themes and trying to like weave in also the work that I do. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Quill. Let's give it up for Quill. Let's get those sparkles going. I'm going to have one little sparkle here. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I think at this moment, we're going to start with the with the Q&A. Uh, so we already have somebody that has a very juicy question. So I'm going to pass the mic to my dear colleague and my dear friend, Michael Washington, a professor here at CCA. Um, and Michael has a question for Valenci. So if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to type them if you don't want to read them or uh, ask, ask them as well. You can raise your hand through the reactions or you can send them to me if you feel a little shy. Uh, so I'm going to pass the mic to Michael, uh, and thank you so much. Thanks, Bernie, good to see you. And thanks for this wonderful um, symposium all week. And thank you, uh, Valencia and Quill, for your work and for sharing and, and being here with us today. Um, Valencia, I was just, your work reminded me of these kind of recent conversations in Black Studies around the afterlives of slavery. I'm thinking about like Sadia Hartman's work and Christina Sharp, um, this kind of idea of the past kind of haunting the present and continue kind of to form and shape our historical present and i was just wondering like is there when you're making your work is there a relationship for you between representing the past and like and, and interacting with it um or um uh, allowing it to kind of to shape us or to affect us in some way or is, is, there, or is there a difference between those two those two things for you hi michael um I don't know if there's so much of a difference, but when I'm in my studio, or even when I'm out of my studio, when I'm sort of like in the conceptual phase of working, I am constantly, you know, holding space for um, our ancestors. And <clears throat> with this particular body of work that I shared with you today, um, they do reference the past, but they also are very much, you know, very current. Um, the idea is you can hold spirit and you can also share community within the, these sculptures and in all of the work. Um, so that's something that is always conscious for me while working, uh, by practicing, through my practice. I think you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Valencia, for that uh, for that answer. Um, and if you have any other questions, uh, you can uh, type them on the chat here. Uh, you can uh, also send them to me if you feel a little shy, or you can raise your hand through the reactions and uh, ask the question. So I I will um, I will ask a, a question now. I'm going to pass it to um, to Quill. Um, Quill, I think something that's so um, powerful about your work is also the, the layers of visual language that you're working with, right? Um, so you're working with different, um, different languages 
you know, that you're referencing and, um, and that you're activating and that you're continuing. So um, could you speak a little bit about the, the reason that you utilize these different layers, right? And that they're, they're sort of emerging, for example, in the image that you have that's showcasing uh, these institutions, right? The institution or the institution of colonialism or these boarding schools. You also have these um, colors emerging, these spirits emerging that are referencing specifically the, the legacy of, of, of the Anishinaabe people. Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, just like referencing in particular that painting of the residential school, for me, like the process is so important. Like, I love the slowness of painting and how I spend like hours on a painting and I'm often like crying by the painting or like, you know, just feeling in these different ways. With that painting, I really like, that's um, a replica of a part of the residential school that my dad went to. So I like looked at a picture and I like, you know, counted the number of windows and I painted that building so perfectly, like with a ruler, with pain, it took me hours. And then to add like everything spilling out of that was like so powerful for me just in the process. Um, like if you look, there's like splatters of paint. So I finished it and then I got to be like, basically like, fuck you to this place and like splatter paint and just like paint all of our beautiful ancestors. And there's little like, things that you wouldn't necessarily know unless I told you, but there's like a little like spirit to represent our babies and elders and then just all of our ancestors like still spilling out of that place. Um, yeah, I think the layering for me is just, it's just reflective of life. Like if you look out on the land, like there's so many layers. So when I go to paint something, there just has to be so many layers. And also for Anishinaabe people, color is really important. It like ties us and marks us to the spirit world in a very specific way. It's part of our, um, like the names that we get, we get colors and that's how um, spirits recognize us. So color is also really important in my work too, not just because it looks cool, but because it's, it's part of that um, tethering to the spirit world. Yeah, beautiful. And we have a question here from one of my incredible students from SF State. Joseph, uh, do you want to unmute yourself or would you like me to read it? Uh, I could go ahead and read it. Fantastic. Uh, thank you both for your presentations and thank you, Profe, for allowing us to be in community. Thank you. Um, familia for also being here today. Uh, I did want to ask to both artists, um, how has your art transformed or changed throughout time, if it has changed at all? And how did you discover art as a revolutionary and, and liberating practice? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I feel like everything evolves in my practice. Um, I, my, the materials that are, I choose are just sort of like, like I said earlier, they're discarded or everyday things. I'm really, really moved by creating something out of nothing you know, and elevating it as much as possible. And that was sort of like a, a jump off point for me as an artist when I realized I could use non-traditional materials to create art. Um, and how I came across art as a revolutionary or liberating practice, you know, I will say that being an artist, working artist, um, having is what I do for a living that in itself is revolutionary and liberating, you know, and the joy it brings me, um, even in the most frustrating moments of, you know, kind of wanting to throw, throw work out and, you know, 
all the writing and everything that's involved, I get so much joy. You know, the fact that um, as a non-binary person can exist and create visibility for other, for, for other people of color, uh, black and indigenous people of color, it's, it's that in itself to me also is revolutionary. Yeah. Also, can we mention before I pass it to Quill, Valencia was also like in a punk band before. So there's a history of music in Valencia and Valencia is all cool here. But Valencia also, you know, was part of that, that big revolution that changed music in the world. And I just want to remind you all that punk is black as fuck. So I'm going to pass um, the mic to Quill, but maybe Valencia can talk about that before uh you know, we finished, but uh, I'm gonna pass the mic now to Quill. That's amazing. I too was in a punk band, but just very briefly when I was 14. <laughs> um, yeah, thinking about how my practice has changed over time. Um, I actually like haven't even thought about that question until right now. And then I was just thinking about it and I was like, wow, this is so interesting. Cause it definitely has changed, I think not so much in terms of like aesthetically or like through different mediums, but just in terms of the sense of responsibility that I feel through my artwork. Um, I just like got off of my mat leave and I've been just like raising my daughter full time. And the like the last painting I did was of her birth and it felt like a responsibility to paint that moment not just for me, but for her. And also for like the other native moms that I connected with during the pandemic who went through pregnancy during that time of isolation and all that. Um, but the painting I did before that was for my daughter. And, and so I just feel like more as I get older, it's just more and more tied to responsibility. And yeah, it just seems to also be traveling further and further away from institutions and like the art world it's like they belong with people now and yeah it's it's really beautiful to to feel like I'm painting for my relations explicitly yeah as I get older it's cool Um, uh, that's, that's really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to invite you all to, uh, feel free to ask a question. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can, uh, type it on the chat or raise your hand. I see here one question. So I'm going to uh, mute myself and pass the mic. Is it me? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Alina. I use they, them pronouns. Also, we and she work too. I'm um, on Muekma Ohlone land and I'm a student at Stanford at the moment, returning from a period of time off because I am, yeah, still finding ways to be here and hold on to myself. Um, so thank you for this nourishment. This is like a really good it's like, I feel like my plate is full and I've been fed. So thank you to both Valencia and to Quill. Um, I'm one, I'm just, yeah, I'm really grateful for these themes of um, uh, the body and also the things we make as methods of communicating with the environment. And I'm studying environmental communication here and very focused on the Text, like spiritual technologies or cultural technologies we can use to, to, to communicate with our ancestors and with the environment. And um, I'm still figuring this out as like um, a person who I'm black, but I'm also multiracial. I'm also Irish, I'm also Choctaw and I've totally silenced those parts of myself. And I'm wondering for you and your practices as you do this, intimate work with ancestors and environment, do you notice other parts of yourself that have been eclipsed coming to the fore and like as in coming up to be <laughs> showcased? Uh, and I'm wondering, does your concept of self change as you make this kind of art and 
if anything comes to mind, then I just wanted to give you the opportunity to speak on that because that's what I'm moving through over here. So this is a question to both Quill and Valency if you want to go for it. Thank you. Um, I can speak to that. That's like quite a tough question. I'm also come from like so many different backgrounds. Um, like I mentioned in my presentation, like I'm Anishinaabe, but also Scottish and Irish and like was raised a lot. Like my Irish grandma had a large role in my upbringing. Um, I think for me, you know, I also grew up in Toronto, like really far away from my territory, and it's been a long process to get back to um, where I'm from. And I think for me, like the practice of making art has just made me feel more whole. Like I feel like my, um, what I carried when I was younger, especially was feeling like I was different parts, like, oh, I'm half Finnish and I'm a quarter Scottish and a quarter Irish. Um, but painting really felt like a more holistic dance with all of those ancestors. And so I really, as I get older, I really see how painting helped me like land in that sense of being a whole person, not different parts and pieces. Um, but I do think, like, I do wonder for myself too, like when or if, any of the other parts would come out like more aesthetically or explicitly, um, but I, I don't have an answer to that yet. <laughs> oh, how do I answer this? Um, I think when it comes to identity and within my practice and the works that I create, it is absolutely rooted in black culture but it's also rooted in, in a spirituality that is universal um i don't like to kind of box check tick out many boxes of who i am um i feel like i've established you know the energy that works for me and that is translated through my practice and i i really am focused on being the most authentic version of myself and creating works that I, I really believe in and that I can tell clear stories through. Um, thank you for such a beautiful question and for uh, beautiful answers. I think, you know, um, while we get another question from folks here, um, feel free to raise your hand or type it on the chat. I also want to speak a little bit about, or just uh, speak and ask a question to both of you. Um, I think, uh, you know, the reason that I, I, I really see remembrance and restitution in your work, I see both of your works as working through, working through historical trauma, right? But working it in such a way that we are left with something powerful, we are left with something uh, that's nourishing as, as, um, as um, the last student mentioned. And we are also, um, we are also given, uh, I, what I sense from both of your works, um, not only a connection to the past, right? But this, um, this continuation into the future. So I also feel very much um, that time is sort of um, really not, linear time is not present in your work, right? That, that I feel the future in your work, but I also feel the past as well. Um, could you all speak to that? I think I, there's somewhere in there was a question. Um, I think more than anything, it was a sentiment, but I, I really, I really feel that in, in the work that you do. And I, and I think more than anything, for the last thing I'll, I'll say is that the restitution um, that is being done through the work that you're creating um, is, is part of this 
this transition, right, that we are, we've been trying to do for the last 530 years of um, between surviving and thriving, right? And I feel that very strongly in your work. So um, I'm going to pass the mic uh, first to Valencia and then to Quill. Um, where do I start? Um, so yes, I agree with you. The work does reflect the past and present and future. Um, these particular sculptures, I'm going to go back to the egg base because I think that they relate to this question um, a lot, is that um, you're taking something that is sort of like a spiritual totem and you apply your beliefs to it and also you honor um, the traditional beliefs with it as well. Um, that definitely pushes it into to the present. Um, and within present, I use these these sculptures for months. And so they're a part of my everyday life and they're a part of ritual. Um, and in the future, they're, you know, I consider to be like sort of these aliens from the sea, you know, and there's parts that I intentionally created to mimic barnacles. And I also use pistachio shells to create um, what, you know, a shell, uh, cowries or whatever they are um, to mimic that. And that also um, gives it some futurism, has futurism to it. Um, I think that's the best way I can answer that. Unless you have something else, I'm, I'm you know, ask yeah i and, and i think i think that that is that is an essence of your work that timelessness and the and the connection of both of your works between the visible world and the invisible world right between what we actually see and what uh, we cannot see but we feel um and yeah just and oh so it, it is amazing i just I'm a huge fan, as y'all can tell. I'm geeking out over here. Uh, okay, and I'm gonna pass the mic to Quill now, but thank you, Valency. That that's a beautiful answer. Um, yeah, this is also a hard one to answer, literally. Um, yeah, I feel like my work does kind of show more of my internal interpretation of the world and kind of that more invisibilized um part of life um i do often think about time and space when i'm painting and um yeah i think like the best way i can relate to this question is um talking a little bit about my tattoo practice um so for me painting uh, i've been like painting my whole life and then three years ago learned how to tattoo which just was kind of like a really natural transition from painting bodies to then like marking bodies. Um, and I was really lucky to like access like the protocols of my territory for how to do that work. Um, but when I do that work, I literally feel like time and space falls away. Um, I don't really know how to explain it, but lots of folks probably know what I'm talking about when you're in like a ceremonial space and things just seem to be different. Um, so that's been really powerful for me to experience and then to then experience that and recognize when it's happening when I'm painting and to be like, oh my God, like this is happening here too. And to feel like the power of that has been really humbling and um, just really cool. So yeah, I think about time and space a lot. And I just not even related to art, just in life, I get such a peacefulness from knowing that time is not real. <laughs> and just, you know, we're just going through the motions, we're bounded by it right now. But just the immediacy of everything else is like right there. Um, and that's something I try to show in my work. So I don't know if that answered your question or not, but <laughs> I, I think it did. And I think, I mean, I think your work answers, I think both of your works answer the question, right? So you you answer it through your words, but the work also answers so many questions 
Um, okay, so I know that there's a student here that wants to uh, say something to, I think, um, I think Olivia, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, um, I'm Olivia. Um, and I reside in Lenape Hoking and I use any pronouns. Um, and I came to this event because like I actually had some, um, I'm deepening my like ancestral spiritual practices and like I've been feeling very enclosed in like my surroundings um, because like I'm breaking away from a lot of colonized thought processes, but like other people are just still kind of like in that. And like a lot of feelings I've been having is like, damn, like, my schools did not freaking prepare me for this shit. Like, like navigating for navigating too many things like on my own, trying to like go through like all these like online resources, being like, damn, what am I doing? What am I doing? And um, Quill, when I saw your um piece about residential schools and the spirits, I was like, oh my god, that's my mind like right now. Like the like all my colonial education, like I had that, and then the spirits are like, boom, goodbye. Don't, you're done with that now. Get out. And like, I just felt very, I feel very liberated um, seeing that. I also feel very liberated, like seeing both y'all's works and I feel very seen. So yeah, I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Olivia, for that beautiful comment. I mean, I think that is the purpose of art, right? And artists, you know, oftentimes in society they people make us think like our work is invaluable. And many times they'll try to convince you that is not valuable by not paying you right by many different things, but uh, it's so valuable. It's valuable on so many levels, right? Art is memory, art is remembering, art is a way to, to really make some really necessary critical changes in our society. Um, and also art, as, as you learned today, is a way to communicate with the ancestors and with other energies that we cannot see, but that are very present here today. So maybe one last question before we go from anybody. I know there, there's that one person that's like a little shy, but maybe wants to ask a question, but hasn't raised their hand. So now is the moment or any comments or questions. Um, the last one before we close. Anybody? Oh, there we go. Eulalia, go ahead. And then Emily. So we have two more questions. Um, this isn't really a question. It's more like elaborate on both artists. I don't know, seeing your guys' project, it's really like opening because I do feel like as a visual learner, there is aspects where you can analyze the image, or the image like by every little detail rather than reading like from a piece of paper. I just thought it was very wonderful to look at the images because they do carry history as well as culture and personal experience, whether it's from family members or experience you have gone through as well. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eulalia. Uh, beautiful comment. And Emily, we'll pass the mic to you now. And I think that'll be the last question. Hauka, Emily, we knit you here. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm from the San Isabel Reservation, the Esquinon village here. Um, I just wanna say thank you and uh, sorry, I kinda got in uh, on Indian time. So I missed out <laughs> on the beginning of uh, the first speaker, but thank you for sharing and sharing your art. Um, but I just wanna say thank you to Quill for sharing. I don't know about you guys <laughs> or folks, but I was definitely tearing up. <laughs> Some of that, you know, stuff is very relatable when it comes to the residential schools. And um, like our last relative said, it's like you feel everything from the past to the future um, when you see Quill's art, it's like you feel it from the core. So just thank you uh, for sharing that. And uh, I guess my question would be, because I know, I know you do a lot of youth work too. So like trying to think of my question, like <laughs> how can, what has like helped or worked 
when it can't when it comes to our youth and art in that way because uh the youth here they need something like that 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 um release that connection and that expression um and and like it's not like you said it's not about just putting a design on a piece of canvas or whatever your, the media may be it's a whole like ceremony almost it's a whole process and um you go through the emotions like you said so how can uh how can you connect that with the youth and what has worked yeah thank you so much for your comments you made me tear up and have the cry voice too i was like shut it back down shut it back down i didn't want to come on here and cry to your question um but yeah i, I guess like what with the youth program um like how it's set up is like first of all it's really small scale like it's just six youth at a time and myself and we work together for a long period of time um, they're all paid really well and it's framed as like you are a resident artist in this program like and they're really proud and happy to be there um, when we hire people like hire youth it's it's always based on like um, making sure we make space for different identities and marginalizations and not in terms of like who has the most credentials or whatever or art experience um and then when it comes down to the actual program it's it's just like we do lots of circles um and i kind of have to just like i every program i just like rip myself open and like share like the hardest parts of everything including you know stuff about residential school and and whatnot and honestly like i found like i don't really have to do much as soon as i like set up that first circle and they know it's safe and they know i'm actually here sharing it they're just like so thirsty to share in a safe space and so like all the work it takes is very minimal in that way and um it's also been like kind of a heartbreaking process too because it is like wow all we have to do is like hold this space and this beautiful life-changing work emerges but there's like so few opportunities to just create that space um but yeah we just we do lots of circles and we talk explicitly about the stuff we talked about today so the first week is the week of the self and we talk about you know who are you and like how have you been disconnected and then the next week is relationships to ancestors we like presence our ancestors um also the body and homeland so we're all like talking about this stuff and it just ends up being like a little family by the end and then at the end we're like do we want to create art i don't know and like sometimes we do or sometimes we just like put something together or you know it's really about just like talking together and presenting all this stuff um yeah so my like if you're talking about your community i feel like when i try to do this work the pushback i get is because people want you to work with more youth at once but i say like no like less is better um and like pay them because they'll be like they'll feel worthy and proud and um it's th they're also bringing so much to the table um so those are like the main things I like to tell people who are interested in this work. It's just set those things up and it, it helps a lot. Thank you so thank you. much, Quill. And thank you, uh, thank you, sibling, Emily. Thank you for, so much for joining. Um, I want to just say uh, thank you, Plaso Kamati Miak, Valencia and Quill and everybody here present. Uh, your work is so important. It really is so nourishing. It's so beautiful. And we thank you deeply from our heart for the work that you're doing, for the way that you show up in community and for uh, many years more of your art and that your art be celebrated 
and that it be remembered for many generations to come. So I just want to say thank you. I appreciate what you're doing and keep going, keep making art. Um, I want to also share here uh, Valencia's and Quill's information. You can follow them on IG right there. There's their handles and also their website. So you can see their work. If you want to invite them to your schools, if you want to invite them uh, maybe to do a show uh, or to do something exciting, right? To create a space for folks. Um, here is the, their information that you can follow them. Um, and I also just want to say uh, that, um, as you can tell, um, art has the capacity Art has the capacity not only to show us a way of researching, right? Ourselves, the world, of understanding the world. Art has the capacity for us to communicate with ourselves, with the ancestors past and future with the descendants. Um, art has the capacity to, to help us time travel. Um, art has the capacity to break down barriers to, to dissolve colonization. Um, art has the capacity to heal. So really let's, let's protect and let's uplift our artists and our storytellers in our community. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the end of this conversation. Let's clap it up for Valencia and Quill. You can unmute yourself. You can say thank you. You can thank do you. some reactions here. Show them some love. Do the little thank sparks. You. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you.